Dr. Rick Kallenberg earned his undergraduate degree from Tennessee Temple in 1968, just a few years ago. <laughs> his THM from DTS in 1972 and his doctorate of theology from Grace Theological Seminary in 1981. Dr. Kallenberg has served on faculty at Moody Bible Institute and Theological Seminary at Multnomah University and is currently teaching here at DTS in the World Missions and Intercultural Studies Department. He served with SIM for 10 years in Nigeria and 12 years stateside in both administrative and faculty roles. He continues to minister in the countries of Africa and Asia as the International Director of the Romans Project, a pastoral training and resourcing ministry. He and his wife, Carol, have four daughters, three sons-in-law, and eight grandchildren. Will you help me in welcoming my friend and brother, Rick Kallenberg? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. What a joy to be able to speak to this wonderful group of uh, Global Proclamation Academy students. I have to apologize to the Africans. They expect me to preach for two hours and I only get 15 minutes, so please. <laughs> I understand your culture, and I love it, but we're in a different culture today, so we'll adjust. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about heaven lately. Two weeks ago, my father-in-law, 97 years old, passed into the presence of the Lord, and last week, one of my missionary mentors of 40 years passed away as well. It's caused me to be more reflective because now I am the patriarch of our family truly, and I am part of what we might call the terminal generation. All things being equal, the Lord not coming back, I'm the next to go to heaven. That causes you to do some reflective thinking. And I've been thinking about my past, and I've been thinking about my future, and I've been thinking about my present ministry. It's a great privilege to be able to keep going at this age and have the opportunity to challenge students in a place like this concerning God's global agenda and purpose and mission. But one of the things I have been thinking about is back to high school days. I actually started Dallas Seminary 50 years ago this summer. I arrived 50 years ago this month to work in a church and started that fall. But in high school, the Lord used some scriptures and other things to encourage me. And one of those scriptures was Colossians chapter three. And I'd like to look real quickly at Colossians 3 and then another passage. I'm going to try to do it very quickly. But thinking about high school, thinking about God's work in my life, reflecting on all of this brings me to a passage like this because this passage of Scripture, Colossians 3, was so important to me. It's like I read it almost every day. I memorized it just because I read it so many times. Here's what Paul says there. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you are dead and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he goes on to challenge the Colossians with the need to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs of the earthly nature, and then he lists some of those things. Paul is telling us our focus, our, our, our focus and our mindset needs to be on Christ and where he is, and that's heaven, and that's where we're headed. And everything we're doing this side of heaven ought to be in light of where home is and where we're headed. Don Whitney, in his book, Ten Questions to Diagnose Your Spiritual Health, tells the story of an English Puritan pastor who is quite well known for his writing, Richard Baxter. This is what he says. He lived during most of the 1600s, though he was in terrible physical condition for nearly all of his 76 years. He lay sick and lonely in a house far from his home, all during the winter of 1646, as he said, sentenced to death by the physicians. For his own use, he began to write out his meditation about the heaven he seemed so near to entering. Thus began what most have considered his most important book, The Saint's Everlasting Rest. 
Believing that his extended thoughts of heaven were so beneficial, when he did recover, he, di he disciplined himself to meditate on heaven, often while walking or at least half, for at least half an hour every day. The practice of regular heavenly meditation, as he called it, transformed Baxter, and it could transform us, says Whitney. Resolving to devote some time on a regular basis to reflect upon the coming world and the coming one would encourage, embolden, strengthen, invigorate, illumine, ravish, and de-stress de us. And anyone who cannot find time to meditate on Jesus and heaven is either wasting time or busier than God intends. Interesting challenge. I suppose if we all kind of committed to that, it might empower that statement that all of us have heard, that someone is so earth, uh, heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. But in my understanding of scripture, including Colossians 3, that the exact opposite is true. And it was certainly true for Baxter. For a Christian to be heavenly minded is a good thing and in fact should motivate us to live more effectively, especially as holy people connected to a holy God headed for a holy place called heaven. Paul says that the premise of his point there in terms of setting our mind on things above is that we're dead with Christ. We've been identified with Christ totally in his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 6 describes the baptism of the Holy Spirit that identifies us with Christ and has tremendous impact on the victory we now have over the flesh and the need to live that out from day to day. We are dead to our self-centered earthly life now. And then in verse 4, he says that we should live our life that way in light of our future. I love this. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we will appear with him in glory. What a glorious future we have. And we've got to live in light of it today. The other passage I'd like to point out says something very similar, and that's 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. In 1 John chapter 3, John is challenging believers, and he says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. And the reason that the world does not know us is that it has not, does, did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we be, will be has not been made known. But we know that when He appears... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now listen to verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We're on this side of heaven, and as John develops in his epistle, we're struggling with opposition. We're struggling with temptation. We're struggling with the enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are in process, but holiness is a part of that process and the goal of that process. And as it, we, we're not perfect yet, but in fact, we anticipate a glorious future. And that future is complete sanctification, glorified perfection in redeemed bodies when this glorious redemptive purpose of God is accomplished in us and in the world. He says that when we we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. We will see Jesus in all of his glorified holiness and splendor as those who have then been made perfect ourselves. We are now fit for eternal life in his holy presence. The fact is, our future hope has huge implications on how we live now, and Paul, uh, excuse me, John makes sure that we get that point. Everyone who has this hope, he says, in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. We want to be like Jesus now. We will be perfectly like him in the future. Paul reiterates this same point in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, where he says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says it in that very dramatic eschatological passage of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, 
speaking of what's going to happen to the earth and that renovation that the Lord's going to accomplish, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness, godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord? The fact is, we have a glorious future. The fact is, we need to be living in light of that future. And that future is holiness. That future is the presence of the holy God. It reminds me of what J.I. Packer wrote. He said, the hope of holy heaven to be enjoyed in the company with our holy Savior is a potent motivation to holiness now. Johnny Erickson Tata, some of you know her name, who has certainly had a lifetime of pain based upon an accent when she was a teenager. She's written a lot about heaven because she's thought about it a lot. And this is what she says in an article she wrote in Discipleship Journal some years ago. Speaking about 1 John chapter 3, she says, Citizens of heaven purify themselves. Strangers and sojourners cut away every earthly sin that entangles. That's the only way to lighten the load here on earth and have a livelier, more buoyant step of faith on the way to heaven. And then she quotes Bishop Ryle once wrote, Heaven is a holy place. Its inhabitants are holy. Its occupants are holy. To be happy in heaven, it stands to reason. We must be prepared for it. And that includes living holy lives this side of heaven. When I was in high school, <clears throat> we used to sing a song. I'm going to heaven, can't wait. Going to see Jesus, can't wait. Heaven's glorious, bright, and fair. Praise the Lord, I'm going there. Be there forever, can't wait. Going to leave never, can't wait. And I know I'll not be late. I'm going to heaven and I can't wait. When I was in high school, that didn't mean anything to me. But 53 years later, it makes a whole new impact on me to think about. I'm close to heaven. Do I think about it? Do I so anticipate it that I can't wait? If I do, I'll live in light of it every day that remains. One of the things when we think about heaven, <clears throat> not only do we think about our Lord and that glorious future that we have, but we also think about the people that we know that are already there. I'd like to tell you in conclusion about my, my aunt. <clears throat> As a teenager and early 20s, she was, had a deeply devotional life. She wrote hundreds of poems, Christian poems, deeply devotional poems, many of them published and quoted by famous Christian uh, writer, uh, readers, uh, excuse me, reader, uh, Christian speakers in those days. Well, she was so brilliant and so gifted that many opportunities opened up to her. <clears throat> She became the personal secretary of the head of the Ford Foundation in those days, who happened to be by the name of Dean Rusk. Some of you know that Dean Rusk became the Secretary of State under President John F. Kennedy. He invited my aunt, who was his personal secretary, to come to Washington and work in the State Department, which she did for over 25 years. She became first name, she had first name basis with the presidents. She was very well known. She did maintain a Bible study um, in her home, and people knew her as a Christian, but that devotional heart for God that led to the writing of her poems seemed to kind of wane during those years. When she was on her deathbed, she asked me to come. By that point, we were missionaries in Nigeria, and we were home on furlough, and she asked me to come, and she said, I want you to read me scriptures about heaven. She didn't want anyone else to bring counsel to her. She didn't want any other comfort than to hear the scriptures that helped her refocus on heaven. The poem she wrote as a teenager, actually early 20s, was entitled Heaven, and I want to read it to you. Heaven's promise, oh, what comfort. Land that knows no pain nor strife. Shores of beauty, dawn unending. Goal towards which to press through life. 
Oh, what joy in Jesus' presence. Christ, whose love is freely mine. He who came to earth to save me. Precious Savior, King divine. I shall worship in his presence, gaze upon his lovely face. Thank God for my soul's salvation. Praise him for his wondrous grace. I shall kneel before my maker. List the heaven's choir sweet. Hear the angels sing his praises. Cast my crowns before his feet. Sinless, perfect, holy city. Gates of pearl and streets of gold. Death shall never draw her curtain. Night shall not its mantle fold. I shall walk and talk with Jesus. He who waits on yonder shore. Oh, my soul doth long for heaven, there to dwell forevermore. I was privileged to do her funeral with Richard Halverson, who was the chaplain of the Senate, and I read that poem. I think when you look at my aunt's life, beginning to end, ultimately, her greatest joy and accomplishment was her walk with Jesus and her anticipation of heaven where she is today. May God help us to live our lives in view of our glorious future in holiness, truly to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promises and hope that your scripture gives us again and again of the glorious future we have as your children. What a glorious privilege we have to know you now, to live like Jesus now, to live in holiness now through the power of the Spirit that you've given us as we prepare our hearts and lives and minds for heaven. Thank you for those who have gone before. Thank you for the anticipation of reunions that I will have with my father-in-law and my missionary mentor. But most of all, thank you that heaven's all about Jesus and we love him. Help us to walk behind him well and reflect his holiness as we go through this day. In Jesus' name, amen.